Hey guys, so I am back out here in Caddis Island County Park. And what I wanted to do for this lab is really just uh, show you the different uh, ecosystem types that you could find in this area. So I'm in Tom's River, New Jersey, but really what I'm gonna be showing you here, you guys should be able to find throughout South Jersey, or at least the outer coastal plain of South Jersey, where a uh, majority of you are located or close to. So um, that's going to be this. I'm going to be walking around showing you different ecosystems. And the idea is I want to highlight those ecosystem categories that we talked about, those components like geology and soil, climate, plants, animals, other living things, and humans, and how they impact the wild plants that are growing out here. And also how we can learn to read the landscape to get ideas about those different factors. So before I go out and start showing you some different habitat types, I thought it would be good, we can talk about some of those categories right off the bat, right? So that first one, geologic and soil features. Where we're located in the outer coastal plain, if we're talking about geology, and remember what was really important was like the different aspects of the soil as well as relief. So relief would be like the vertical of the land, how it changes vertically and probably horizontally. Uh, is it mountainous, mountainous, flat, etc. cetera. Um, out here in the outer coastal plain, as you guys are probably aware, it's very flat and our soil is very sandy. And the reason is because this area was formed from marine deposits, sand deposits. What happened back in the uh, Cenozoic, I believe, so about 65 million, starting 65 million years ago, um, this area of New Jersey went through a period of being covered by the ocean and then the ocean would recede and it would be covered and recede. And every time it was covered, they would lay down more sand, more sediment, and then eventually would recede. So that repeated covering uh, built up this outer coastal plain area that we are living on now. But because of that origin, of that marine origin, our soils are sandy, primarily sandy. Now you can contrast this with the intercoastal plain, which was found uh, more west. You guys are on the border of it, some of you. Some of you may be in it, depending on where you live. Uh, that area also was uh, is older, right? So that formed earlier. It also had some encroachment of the sea, so it has some of that marine deposits, but it also got deposits from the west of these mountainous regions, and there would be the sediment runoff. So that sediment runoff was a little more fine. It wasn't the marine deposits, and because of that, it mixed up a little bit. It changed the composition of the soil, and it makes it a little better at holding water and has a little bit more organic material. So that's why in that intercoastal plain, typically you will find better soils for agriculture than out here on the outer coastal plain. And we can also talk about uh, further up in North Jersey where uh, there was more volcanic activity, some glacier activity, and we have different soils up there as a result. But to start with, here in the outer coastal plain, sandy soils due to this marine origin. And then we can talk about climate. Right, and then climate, what was important was temperature. Here in New Jersey, the average temperature is around 53 degrees Fahrenheit, although it's been going up uh, each year due to climate change. The, um, while that's the average, there is some variation between North Jersey and South Jersey. Um, it gets warmer in South Jersey earlier and it stays warmer a little bit later. So if we're talking about the growing season, which there's various definitions, but if we're talking about a definition of the time when the temperature is above 43 degrees Fahrenheit, um, we get about five more weeks of growing season in South Jersey than you do in North Jersey due to that temperature variation. Precipitation is pretty steady throughout. It's about um, 45 inches of rain a year. And like I said, that's pretty even from North and South Jersey. Uh, what affects plant growth more so than precipitation in North and South Jersey is the soils that we will talk about and talked about a little bit already. And then light, I think the shortest day we get about nine hours of light, longest day we get 15 and we average somewhere around 12. So there's our climate. And then um, 
plants we're going to talk about on our walk and humans is actually pretty interesting. So if we're talking about humans and human effects in New Jersey, we have um, evidence of the occupation of New Jersey by the Lenny Lenape uh, 7,000 years ago. So we knew we know they were in New Jersey at that time. They had um, villages al primarily along the Delaware and maybe along the coast, but not so much in the interior of South Jersey. Uh, however, they did impact that area. They would set fires to drive game and to kind of open up and clear trails for them to make easier walking. So they were here in New Jersey. Um, when Europeans started colonizing, this was originally a Dutch colony, but by the 16, I think middle 1600s, it was an English colony. With increased colonization, we drastically altered the environment just like the Native Americans who were here before us, we settled primarily along these river valley areas. Uh, and then as industry built throughout the years, we um, really cleared land for farmland. We cleared land for charcoal production, for glass production. Uh, I think there's another bog iron production. Um, regardless, what this means is that within New Jersey, uh, every forest at one point was clear cut. So everything that you see growing now is growing since, I believe it's 1860, uh, was, by 1860, everything had been clear cut. So everything you see here, every tree, the oldest tree you're gonna find in New Jersey is, uh, the oldest it can't, most likely is gonna be, is from the 1860s, right? So this is all relatively new growth that we're seeing here. So some of the effects. Uh, and then, you know, we can have continued effects throughout the years. So enough of that. Let's take a look at some of the different ecosystems you see here, and we'll discuss some hopefully interesting things. All right, so I thought this would be interesting uh, to talk about with you guys. So if you see here, we are on the edge of what's going to be a salt marsh. That salt marsh, the real nicer salt marsh, is a little further on that way. If you look over there, that's Barnegat Bay. And back here... This grades into more of a freshwater swamp, right? So this is kind of brackishy area right about here. But what's interesting is you see all these dead trees, right? Those look like dead pines, a lot of them, maybe some old red cedars that are dead. What has happened is this is a result of rising water levels, right? So this used to be uh, forested. Um, possibly was a uh, kind of a forested wetland, could have been more upland, but with the changing hydrology of Barnegat Bay, and there's a number of reasons why this would have happened, um, it resulted in more salt water moving further back into the forest, and that killed all these trees. So just something interesting for you guys to see. You also see all this in front of me right here. The dominant plant species that you see growing there is Phragmites australis. It is your, it's a very uh, bad invasive, right? You'll see it all the time. It, and what it does is, as you see here, is it takes over areas, particularly recently disturbed areas. So likely what happened is this was a forested area. As that salt water came in, it killed off pretty much everything else. And it allowed for this frag, which is water tolerant and a little bit salt tolerant to move in and kind of dominate the landscape. But we also have something cool. This guy poking out right here is not Phragmites. This is big cord grass. I think it's Spartina sinusoroides, possibly. I may be wrong about that. Um, but that's a native plant, that's pretty cool. There is a native version of Phragmites, this guy right here, but pretty much the majority of what we're seeing is non-native came over from Europe. So, something interesting for you guys. Okay, so this is our uh, typical pine dominated, this is a little more oak dominated forest that you will find in the Pine Barrens, right? In the, um, what you see is a canopy that is dominated by various oak species as well as pitch pine and an understory that consists primarily of heath species. So these are black huckleberry, low bush blueberry, 
there's something called dangleberry that you may find, something called staggerbush, that tea berry, essentially all in this heath family. And these plants grow well in sandy acidic soil, which is what you find throughout this region, right? So by knowing a little bit about the plants, we can understand a little bit about the soil and maybe the climate that we have here as well. But we can also go and actually look at the soil itself, right? So when I talked about soils in the lecture, I said that there's a a couple important characteristics of soils. One is organic material, which we're not gonna be able to really look at here. But the other really important part of soil is texture, right? And texture of the soil is determined by the percentage of sand, silt, and clay, right? So the larger particles, the sand particles, um, hold less water, right? There's bigger gaps and water can flow right through. And the smaller particles hold more water. So the way to determine texture, kind of an offhand way if you're out in the field, is you pick up a ball of soil. You want to make sure it's a little bit wet. Luckily, it just rained out here. And then you start to try and make a ribbon with your fingers. And if it holds a ribbon, if it doesn't hold any ribbon like we see here, that's a sandy soil. Sometimes, I may try and find some if we can find it out here. Sometimes it'll hold a little bit of a ribbon. So. You can go like that. If I go like that, it'll push out further and further, further. If it pushes out a little bit, like an inch, we would we would classify that as a loam soil. So kind of like a middle soil between sandy and clay. And if it, you can really ribbon it out several inches, that's a more clay soil. All right, and so understanding that soil, we're gonna understand the water holding capacity and that's gonna determine what plants can grow in the area. So a thing to be aware of as you're trying to read the landscape is paying attention to changes in plants. And those changes could be both changes in the species that are present and in the actual growth of the plants. So if you look in this area, I walked maybe 50 feet in one direction, and you can start to see some differences. First off, we're starting to see, I don't know if you can make it out in the distance, you're starting to see some maples back there. And now maples, all of our plants have a range of tolerance for abiotic factors. So how much water in the soil they can uh, tolerate. Uh, that's particularly what is changing, uh, what changes your plants that you see out here. Um, but you also see our understory is the same and it's kind of hard on video, but you can see the plants are getting a little taller, right? So right in this area, your canopy still consists of pines, but you're starting to see a little bit taller heath understory, and you may start to see some changes in the composition. Um, I definitely see them further on, so we'll look a little further on. But what this is indicating is that the water table in this area is getting higher, right? So there is a habitat in the pine barrens called a pitch pine lowland and that is this intermediary between your pitch pine uplands and your more wet uh, red maple swamps that we'll see in a little bit but this pitch pine lowland is, you still have the same canopy but your understory the plants start getting a little bit bigger there's a little more water in this area and you start to see some different more water loving plants such as this guy right here this is clethra ulnifolia or sweet pepper bush so that's more of a wetland plant, right? So by understanding the, um, the factors that our plants like, the abiotic factors that our plants like, that range of tolerance, we can start to identify a little bit more about what our habitat might be like. So this we would say is more of a pitch pine lowland, and then it's gonna grade really directly here, although there's this little fire break going to degrade pretty much into a red maple swamp. Now in this area I've seen much better transitions. Uh, this is a relatively small area but you can see stark difference in our understory here right? Got all our heath plants, no heath plants. A little bit further up we are going to see a little change in the understory but besides the understory we see differences in our canopy 
right up there, we're starting to see maple trees. And then what's the other big tree that you find in a red maple swamp in the Pine Barrens? Black gum. That is that baby right there. That's the one that produces, also called sour gum. I eat those berries. Very, very sour, but kind of tasty. So that's the difference that you see, right? None of that low heath understory, but you start seeing taller plants. And one of the cool ones that you see in the Pine Barrens, instead of our low bush blueberry, you start to see high bush blueberry, like this guy, much taller. Right? And you'll see that through out if we go further up into this understory. But again, a way to recognize some changes in your ecosystem, in your habitat. We see changing plant species. We also see some different characteristics that this might be a wetland. One of the things you can look for is more buttressed roots or buttressed trunks. See how that trunk kind of splays out on the bottom there? That's because our roots in this wetland area are more shallow, right? Our trees, they're not gonna dig down and become waterlogged, so they keep their roots more shallow and that makes those more buttressed trunks. Another example that this area is a wetland uh, are these water-stained leaves. So if you look down, you'll see that these leaves right here are really, really dark. That's an indication that this area becomes inundated at certain points. So here, right there, you can see those leaves. becomes inundated at certain points and it holds water and that causes that uh, dark look of the leaves. All right, so definitely changes in our plant composition. If we were farmers in this area, we would have to be aware that this area is a wetland and our traditional crops are not gonna be able to plant here without some sort of drainage, or we could grow wetland crops. All right, and here we have a salt marsh. So here, the plants that are growing are dictated not only by the amount of water, but also by salt, All right? So there are plants that are salt tolerant and there are many that aren't. So what you'll find here in a typical salt marsh is just like in our upland as it grades to wetland, within our salt marsh, we have this gradation that you will see. So further upland, so where it is less wet, you will typically find your shrub species. Now we have two pretty common shrubs. We have Iva fructescens, or Ivy fructescens, I think it's Iva, or high tide bush, which is this guy right here. And how you, a good way to remember it is the leaves here are opposite. And we also have Baccharis hemilifolia, or groundsel bush, which is this guy. So they look similar. Their leaves are slightly different, but the big way to tell them apart is these guys, their leaves are alternate, right? So if you're on the stem, you have one leaf, then a break, then another leaf. Whereas our opposite leaves, they're right across from each other, if you guys can see that. Okay, so you would have your shrub species further up, high tide bush, it gets its name because these are tidal systems and generally during high tide, that's the extent of where the water comes up. But then further out, you have two main uh, species. You have Spartina patens and Spartina alterniflora. So again, where they're gonna be located is gonna be based on water. So closer to the water, you should find Spartina alterniflora and that's the higher plants that you see there. That's slightly higher. And then what forms that low kind of grassy, that's, yeah, you see primarily throughout there is Spartina patens. And that is found a little more upland. Here's not a great example because there's all these little creeks, but you will see sometimes in salt marshes this nice grading that goes from shrubs to patens to alterniflora out there. But again, this is an ecosystem just like throughout New Jersey that is determined primarily by water availability and the water table. And here it just happens to be brackish or salt water. So that's gonna change things as well. But there has been agriculture throughout here. 
Historically, I know along the Delaware Bay, these salt marshes, they farmed them for salt hay. So they were to sell that patents as hay. Although it's not good for the environment, very uh, damaged these wetlands, but there was products that they could use out of it. Nowadays, if we go further back out there into the bay, I think uh, people should think about aquaculture, right? That's big, that's a big business that is starting to ramp up in New Jersey, uh, growing oysters, uh, but not only oysters. I mean, we've been focusing on oysters, but there are people that are combining enterprises. So just like in the lecture video where they were growing rice and also uh, fish and ducks, you can combine some aquaculture enterprises and you can grow oysters, but you can also grow mussels. And on the top, you can grow algae. Uh, and I think that uh, combining might be a, a really nice business for the future. So some things to think about. Uh, for our folks who have property or live out in Oregon or think about going out to Oregon on the West Coast, uh, one of the new agricultural, relatively new, is kelp farming. All right, so kelp farming is starting to take off out there. Again, something to think about. All right, so that is it for your lab today. Really, I just kind of wanted to show you around to some different types of ecosystems that you may find. Um, unfortunately, you couldn't be out here with me. I think that might been a, might have been a little bit more fun. I could have ID'd some plants. Right here, we've got some different fish species that are swimming around. We could have looked at. But uh, hopefully, you guys learned a little bit and you have a better appreciation for the different ecosystems that you can find really just in southern New Jersey. And I didn't even touch on them all. We missed Atlantic White Cedar Swamps. We don't have them here, or at least where I'm at. There are uh, other types of freshwater wetlands that are non-forested that we didn't get to look at, but you got a little taste. So that is that. I hope you guys have a good day.